Cameron came into this world with a rocky start. When he was born, I had to have an emergency C-section because he wasn't getting enough oxygen. But after that, I mean, he, he flourished. I mean, he was walking before he was a year old. He was talking young. He accelerated the older he got in high school. He was in advanced placement classes. And he was just always really smart, very intelligent. Cameron was always, uh, he was outgoing. He played a lot of different types of sports. Very compassionate person. You know, he was always for the underdog. Life was pretty normal. I mean, I would say, you know, white picket fence type family. You know, we didn't move around a lot. It was pretty stable family environment. Cameron and I grew up together. We went to school in starting in kindergarten. We were pretty much as close as two people could be without being, you know, blood related. I mean, he was definitely part of our family. He was a second son. He was a brother. He was the kid that you really just wanted your kids to be friends with. He just fit in. He was comfortable. He was easy. Um, he was a nice kid. I got a phone call one day at work from one of his best friends saying that he had Cameron in his truck and that he was taking him to the urgent care because Cameron broke his collarbone. When we were at urgent care, they took um, x-rays and basically said he was gonna need surgery. I was there, you know, with him when he had the surgery and then picked him up when he was in recovery and they gave me a prescription and you, you do whatever the doctor tells you to do. So I filled the prescription. I mean, he told me he had been prescribed them, but we were 15, 16, you know, if the doctor says, hey, use this for your pain, we didn't think any thing of it. I didn't think anything of it at the time. It's what you did. You got your pills, you got better, you were out of pain, and you went back to playing sports. Three months later, Cameron broke his other collarbone. Cameron was prescribed more opioids after that injury. So he had two prescriptions within a, about a three-month period. I mean, the changes were gradual at first. He was ditching school, um, wrestling practice was starting, he was missing wrestling practice. He just wasn't himself. His grades were plummeting. It just, it, something was just off with him. Drugs was the last thing that I ever suspected. I had taken him to a counseling session and the counselor asked all the right questions and figured it out. So that's how I found out. Otherwise, I don't know how much longer it would have been before I figured out what was going on. He told me at some point that they, they made him feel like Superman. But 16-year-old kid doesn't want to feel like Superman. Once his pills ran out and once he wasn't able to get prescriptions anymore, you know, he needed to figure out a way to keep from getting sick. You know, heroin was a logical step. It's a lot cheaper than pills and it's a lot easier to get. The word heroin to me was like a 1970s, um, you know, rock star type drug. I mean, it didn't happen to 16-year-old kids that lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When we figured out that it was heroin, I kind of at first was relieved. Like there was a sense of relief, like, okay, phew, now I know what it is, now let's fix it. And I asked the counselor, I was like, okay, what do we do to fix this? Now we know what it is. And I just remember her shaking her head and she said, it's not that easy. It's a pretty sudden progression, you know, once he got addicted. And we were shocked. I mean, it, that doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen to us, to our friends. I mean, yeah, you hear about it, but uh, it's, it happens to other people. It doesn't happen to people I know. As Cameron's addiction progressed, in the back of my mind, I always knew that there was a chance that he was going to um, succumb to this disease. So he had had multiple months of, of sober time under his belt. And so for him, when he went back to using, you know, he used the same amount that he used um, before. And that's what ended up causing him to overdose. So when I found him, it was 7.30 in the morning. I was getting ready to go running with a neighbor and we were gonna meet outside at 7.30. And I, I went into his room to check on him and, and he was passed away in his bed. So as 
I'm walking up into the courtyard, um, my father is sitting on the bench. He only sits on the bench in the courtyard when something terrible has happened. Um, but I think he stood up. It's like, Cameron's gone. And um, he said my mom was over at Jen's house and um, I just remember saying I need to be there. <laughs> I just knew I needed this where I needed to be at that time. It was like a dream. It was, it was a complete shock. Like I, I knew in my heart that it was extremely possible that this was gonna happen, but I never really thought that it would happen. We had no idea what was gonna to happen to Cameron. Although in the back of your mind, you, you know that the worst can happen, which it did, uh, and that would be death by overdose. Uh, it was a de devastating day. Overall, if you had one thing to say to Cameron right now, looking back on this journey, what would that be? <laughs> I just tell him I loved him. Made to. <laughs> this is a book that Jennifer made, and it's all about Cameron. This is a song. It's called One Way Track to Hell. And in it, he describes his addiction and what he was going through. Just one weekend in a bathroom full of homies. I was introduced to something that is phony. It tells you and promises you it will set you free. But I'm thinking to myself, does this substance even know me? No, but the obsession does. As you drifted to an eye slouching buzz, you just smelt the fragrance, felt the temptation. And y'all already know here comes the justification. Well, it gives you an insight what he was dealing with um, and how, I guess, how drugs get a hold of you. And of course, I have a flash drive with all of his poems and everything on it. And so sometimes I just go back and listen to it. Psych meds and oxys will capture you too. And that is the truth, as harsh as it seems. That is the truth, that is the truth, that is the truth, that is the truth. This is Serenity Mates, the Youth Recovery Center. And every time we walk, into this lodge. We see Cameron's Lodge, which is right by the door. And, you know, in our memorial garden, we have um, a, a stone there for, for Cameron. He struggled with an addiction to painkillers. He had been sober about two years when we met, but he struggled for about five years with an addiction to painkillers. We always say she comes at it from the side of loss, I come at it through the side of recovery. He knew exactly what I was going through in trying to help my son because he experienced it firsthand. Cameron's need to get clean and he couldn't, he couldn't find a place that would help him. And so our goal is to be that place to help the kids. We provide group therapy, which is IOP, individual therapy, uh, case management, and we provide a lot of structure and accountability here. One of the main goals here is to get the kids to be able to function on their own once they leave our treatment center. With Serenity Mesa, it gives these kids a chance to rebuild their lives. Well, as the, the saying goes, you know, I think Jennifer was handed lemons and she made lemonade.
I learn a lot about Cameron pretty much every day. And Cameron is still a part of our lives. We see Cameron in every kid who comes through this facility. I'm the emotional one, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Cameron, um, Cameron's legacy is here every day when another kid has to walk through our door to get help. I feel like, you know, he's with us and his hand is helping us with Shorten Mesa. I definitely know that. I can feel him guiding us just to make the right decisions for these young people. She took it upon herself to make that resource so that no other parents have to bury their son or their daughter. <laughs>